Good morning. morning. Welcome uh, to worship this morning. Uh, You you may not have noticed this, um, but your ears may have hearkened back uh, to a previous age uh, when uh, the organist who's playing for us today uh, regularly played in this uh, sanctuary. Matthew Penning is in town and he was filling in for Dan Miller. So we get wonderful fugues, uh, as, uh, as a lover of Bach would do. Matthew, thank you for being here this morning. <laughs> Been great to see Matthew this week. A um, few announcements uh, to bring to your attention. Um, As uh, we've been doing every week, just remind you, uh, these yellow cards, really helpful for us, and we're inviting everyone to fill one of these out every Sunday and throw it in the offering tray when it comes by you. Really appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, Remind you that uh, there is a a worship night coming. uh, Jess, what's the date of that? August 12th. Um, so it's uh, a week and a half away and, uh, um, and invite you to, uh, actually, next Sunday, right? Is that right? Six days. Saturday night. Okay. I put down here worship night. I didn't put any details for when it was or what time it was. Uh, so that's brilliant. Uh, way to go, Pastor Jim. We are meeting uh, out on the patio for that uh, and uh, invite you to come uh, filled with uh, opportunities to sing uh, wonderful worship music and uh, we'd love to, uh, to share that evening with you next Saturday night. Uh, another date uh, to keep in mind is uh, Rally Day. Um, uh, that's the, the second Sunday of uh, September again. We are changing our... Uh, Uh, worship times back to 8.30 and 10.30, so uh, it will be important for you to recall that as we get closer to that date. we still got several weeks before we get there, so uh, stock up on an extra half an hour of sleep between now and then, uh, and uh, and we'll start uh, rally day um, uh, on the 10th of September at 8.30. Wonderful. gather this morning um, and uh, prepare our hearts uh, for worship uh, by uh, beginning with uh, a brief order for confession and forgiveness. I invite you to stand uh, this morning as we share in that confession. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to kneel as you are comfortably able and share this confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a member of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. in the world, for the health of the church, for the unity of all. For this holy house, for all who worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way. Kyrie on every day, that we may live out your impassioned response to the hungry and the poor, that we may live out truth and justice and grace, let us pray to the Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison. On our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. For peace in our hearts, for peace in our homes, for friends and family. For life and for love, for our work and our play, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison, every day. For your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison, every day. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia! Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, and blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun His reign. Alleluia! Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let's join together in our prayer of the day. O God, eternal goodness, immeasurable love, 
You place your gifts before us. We eat and are satisfied. Fill us and this world in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I'll invite the kids to come up and join me up here. All right. All right, good to see everyone. Ah, good crew this morning. Everyone doing all right? Yeah. Okay, good deal. Enjoying the summer? Yeah. Love the warm weather? Yep, absolutely. Hey, um, who here likes dessert? Anyone? Okay, all right, good, good. I'm glad to see that. Um, you guys have a favorite dessert? What do you think? Logan, what do you got? Ice cream. Someone said ice cream. Hmm. I forgot. What do you think? Brownies and vanilla ice cream. Brownies and vanilla ice cream. Very good. What do you got? Um, I like um, ice cream cake. Ice cream cake. Okay. Um, my favorite dessert is apple pie. Homemade apple pie. It's a good one, right? When I was, a, yeah, what do you got? Strawberry. Oh, you like strawberry better. Oh, wow, that's good. I'm, I'm in favor of all pie for the most part, as long as it doesn't have coconut in it. But I know, I know, I'm very, I know, I'm sorry. This is a entirely different conversation that I wanted to get into this morning. Um, when I was a kid, I had uh, two sisters, or have two sisters, and a brother, and, um, and when mom on Thanksgiving would make an apple pie, there would often be one piece that was left. And I was too full to eat another piece of pie, so what I would do, I would save it for the next day, right? The problem is, with two sisters and a brother, how can I be sure that it will be there when I wake up in the morning? You know what I did? I would put it in the cupboard where no one would find it. So when I got up, I know I'm very cruel, aren't I? It's very selfish, Pastor Jim. Pastor Jim was not always the upstanding citizen you see before you now. <laughs> um, so I would save the pie for later, right? Um, we use that word save a lot in the church, right? I'm saved and you're saved. All of us are saved. So the question is, do you think God thinks of saving like I do with the apple pie, right? Hold it for later, right? Save it up for later. When we get to heaven, we'll get to be with God. I think that's not right. I think God saves us to make a part of the work of saving, right? So when we see someone who is struggling or hungry or without a home, at St. Matthew, we help to be a part of a work that would save them, right? Give them a place to stay or we feed them. So in the same way, we see um, our world with a climate that's um, sort of changing and in trouble, and we would want to help save it, right? When we see um, nations that are being abused by others, we would want to help save them, right? So the work of saving is not just God saving us up for later, it's about welcoming us in to the work of saving, right? To be a part of it, faithful in the world. That's a, that's a good reminder. We're going to talk about that a little bit today with some texts that you guys might know. So, can we pray about that? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you save us. You work in each of our lives, each of our hearts, each of our own stories, to hold us and keep us and claim us. But Lord, you are in the work of saving the world. And we know that you invite us into that good and holy work. Lord, feed our imaginations, our efforts, and our hope on the gift of that saving work. 
We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, thank you for coming up this morning. reading from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors, our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Here ends the reading. The second lesson is from Romans, the fifth chapter. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here ends the reading. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Uh, This summer we've been um, working through a a sermon series that invites us uh, to, to think seriously about how Scripture works as a as a resource uh, for the Christian life, right? The Christian life is not best defined by a list of do's and don'ts, right? Um, Our our faith in our relationship with God um, is uh, is active and engaged, and and the Bible that we hold dear is is a... a collection of testimonies from people who shared lives like ours, shared lives in relationship with God. So, um, so themes like justice and, and mercy and righteousness and compassion, all of these themes we find laid down in Scripture, not described as dogmas, but rather represented in stories. And the wonderful thing about this wonderful collection of, uh, of testimonies and stories is that they work together, right? They work in, uh, in, in, in coordination and sometimes competition. There's, there's a, a moving against each other and, uh, and, and a mutual support of complement uh, between these stories as we engage in them. So we have these contrasting themes that come to us, invite us to imagine how both can be true, how we can see the, mit- the truth in the midst of, uh, of the contrasting stories. Um, it does make, I will admit, um, for um, challenging um, our study of Scripture, challenging how we preach uh, Scripture, and um, and I, uh, I I wrote up this uh, this sermon series and uh, defined these wonderful contrasting, challenging texts, and then. I went on vacation for three weeks and uh, and asked uh, Pastor Jess and Deacon Sue to uh, to just take on the challenge of those texts and really dive in and work hard at those passages. And um, I want to apologize to the two of them. I want to. I'm not there yet, but I, I want to, and that's the first step um, to uh, redeeming that. But uh, they both did so well. I, I don't see any problem with it at all. We're uh, we're all uh, good, actually. Um, uh, last Sunday, uh, Pastor Jess took on the task of defining sin, and actually, this morning for the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be building on uh, Pastor Jess's description or definition of sin, and we'll kind of develop an ongoing understanding of the themes we have uh, this morning and for the next couple of weeks, Uh, sort of a a progressive sermon that extends over several weeks. Um, Pastor Jess... uh, 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 Work to define the the understanding of the sin of sin uh, in the scripture, and there are two um, definitions for sin, as uh, she describes it. There's sins, that is plural, right, which are the individual infractions against the law, right? The Hebrew word for sin and the Greek word for sin, both of them mean missing the mark, right? So God's law is the mark, and when we miss the mark, we have sinned, right? So sins in the plural refers to the individual infractions uh, against the law. But the New Testament, and in particular, the Apostle Paul, talks about sin in a new way. Not sins plural, but sin meaning a generalized condition of brokenness that all of us reside in, right? We are sinners. And indeed, it's not just our brokenness. All of creation holds that brokenness, right? 
Martin Luther has a, a wonderful phrase for gathering those two definitions together. The Latin is incurvatus in se, right? Incurvatus in se. Um, everyone say that with me. Incurvatus in se. Impress your friends with that. Um, it means uh, to turn the world in on ourselves or to curve the world in on ourselves. And uh, uh, Harry Wendt has a wonderful image. Uh, Harry Wendt is the, the author of the Crossways series. And uh, this is the image he uses uh, to talk about sin. It's all through uh, this, the, uh, the two-year series uh, that he writes for understanding Scripture. Uh, whenever you talk about sin, this is Harry Wendt's image, right? So there's an individual at the center, and everything is curved in on that individual, right? All the interests of the heart of, uh, of, of, of containing or self-containing uh, the focus of our understanding about the world. So this is the definition uh, for sin or the image for sin. Today we're talking about salvation, and uh, I thought we'd start with an image that uh, would help sort of uh, define what we mean when we generally talk about uh, salvation, right? So here's a happy guy. Uh, it's got Jesus in his heart. You see the little heart with the cross in it. And, uh, and he should be happy, right? Um, uh, because uh, he's going up to heaven, right? That's, that's, generally, that's generally how we think about salvation when we talk about it in the church. And rightfully so, right? We get that image from that wonderful passage uh, that we all love, John 3, 16. All right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Right? Let me just reiterate, okay? The gift of salvation is a clear and certain promise, right? In fact, there is no promise more central to the gospel than the simple equation that God's love plus our faith produces eternal salvation, right? Absolutely. My only suggestion for your reconsideration of that definition is to recognize the context into which Jesus is speaking when he first says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? He, uh, Jesus is a good and faithful Jew. So the Jewish understanding of salvation might be significant in our understanding what Jesus intends for us as we think about salvation. So, here's the question. When Jews think about salvation, what is the story or the metaphor that is most typically in their minds? It's the exodus out of Egypt. We saw it in that psalm that we read moments ago, right? And that's an interesting perspective for salvation. For one thing, if, if that's our metaphor for salvation, then God's saving act is not something that happens after I die. Salvation defines my present. It defines my place in the world. Why? Because God, in my past, saved my nation, led me through the wilderness, established me in a land of promise. 
the text that we read from uh, Psalm 80 or that Derek read for, to us a moment ago, um, wonderful, beautiful psalm. It's a psalm of complaint. We read verses uh, 1 through 7. Verses 8 and 9 say this. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land, right? That's an image of coming into the promised land. It's an image of God redeeming actively the lives of those who were led. The second thing to notice in, uh, in this metaphor for salvation, this Jewish metaphor, is, that, um, is to notice that Israel's assumption of salvation is a corporate event, right? It's a corporate event. God saves not just me. God saves all of the nation of Israel. Indeed, for a Jewish mindset, I am saved because I'm a part of the nation that God led out of slavery and into the promised land. Again, uh, from Psalm 80, verse 7. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved, right? All plural pronouns. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we might be saved. Finally, the Jewish context or metaphor for salvation understands that salvation comes to us not to get me individually into a place of comfort and security. God's salvation comes to fulfill a destiny and a purpose in the world. God says to Abraham, Come and follow me. I claim you, you are mine. But then God follows it up with a description of why God has called, why God has redeemed, why God has saved Abraham to himself. He says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, if we are going to account for this contrasting definition of salvation, how might we do it? Well, here's a radical proposal. What if salvation isn't just this image, but rather this image? The Bible is a story that begins in a garden and ends in a city, right? The Garden of Eden and the city of God coming down out of heaven, right? In the book of Revelation. God, in the work of salvation, the understanding that, that captures the entire scope of that work of salvation recognizes that there is a sin that has fractured that good creation, right? It has fractured and broken the world out of what God intended for it, and the repairing of that sin is salvation. But not just the human event of salvation. No, if we're thinking about that work, the full scope of that work of salvation, it's not just humans being saved. It's a power and an authority that redeems all of creation, actively engaged in the process of salvation for all the earth. Let me say this again. None of these contrasting passages are intending to say that one is true and the other is false. That is not what I'm saying. 
No, these two definitions for salvation work together to clarify the truth of how we understand salvation. But what I hope is clear in this consideration is that Jesus does not come to be a resource to make you a better you. That's not the primary intent. No, Jesus saves you to make you a part of the great task of bringing salvation into the world. It's not about a little Jesus coming to live inside of my heart to, incle to increase my self-reverence and my isolation. It is about making me a little part of the kingdom of God that is coming into the world and into our lives. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that all who believe, all who trust in him will have the gift and become a part of the gift of eternal salvation. Amen. Let's stand this morning and confess our faith. This morning our confession is the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please greet each other as you're comfortable with that blessing of peace this morning.
Will you stand with me as you're comfortably able? As our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gathered with his friends uh, the night before he was, or actually the night that he was betrayed, he gave another gift, uh, a gift that coincides with our salvation, and that is the promise to be present in this meal whenever we gather and partake in it. And it's one of the many things that we do, but one of the most important things that we do to remember that gift of salvation. And we remember that we take of it together in community, gathered together, as that is the point of a meal. And the point of the Lord's meal is to be together and to recognize Jesus' love present in the midst of it. And so we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it for all to eat, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so we pray together as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The bread has been broken, the wine has been poured. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, and all are welcome at Christ's table. You may be seated and come forward as the ushers guide you. For those of you who are at home, if you are with other people, I would invite you to serve one another. And if you are not, please hear these words. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Will you stand with me as you're comfortably able, please? Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And let's pray together for one another, for our community, for our nation, and our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Creator, we come to you in gratitude this morning. We give you gratitude for the meal that you have instituted with us and shared with us and been present in every time that we gather together and partake of it. And we give you thanks for your salvation, for the gift that it is to be brought out of sin and death and darkness and brought together towards the Holy Land. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for those who do not yet know your promise for them, who do not yet know the freedom from darkness and the freedom from pain. We pray that they might feel the freedom present for them in you, in your love and unending mercy and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering, for those who are dealing with pain and illness and injury. We pray for their caregivers, their medical providers. We pray that they might know your peace and comfort and that their pain and discomfort might come to an end. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for all who are grieving, all who are lonely, all who are suffering in heart and mind. May they know the peace and light of your good news. May your comfort be upon them even in their saddest times. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for our planet in the midst of difficult weather, in the midst of violence, in the midst of climate change. We pray for care for all humans, but also for all of creation. Lord, in your mercy. God, we lift to you all of the things that are on our hearts and minds, individuals, places, things. We lift them to you now in our hearts. God, we lift all of these prayers to you and the prayers that you know are on our hearts even when they're not spoken. And we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We are actually going to bring forward the middle school service learning team before our benediction. So I'm going to hand the speaking part over to Pastor Jim because I am attending, so I can't commission myself. Handsome crew. All right. I was on this, uh, this trip last year. It was a lot of fun. Good group, right? Yeah, wherever you want here. Okay. Um, these are um, uh, representatives of uh, our community, and we send them out uh, to represent us and to represent the gospel. Uh, that we hold dear. And so I'm going to ask you to respond uh, to, uh, to three promises. Um, as, you, uh, as you take up this task of learning and discovering and, uh, and caring um, uh, for, for those you are sent to, do you promise to be authentic expressions of God's love to all you serve? If so, you say, we do. We do. Do you promise to support and affirm each other as the body of Christ? If so, We do. Do you promise to be available uh, to God's presence uh, that you might grow in faith, that you might discover more about yourself and more about God's plan for you? If so, we we do. Okay. God bless you and keep you. God watch over you continually with safety and uh, and encouragement, and uh, God bring you back filled with stories testimonies of God's grace in your life, of saving the world, all those uh, also that you may meet. So uh, let's uh, extend our appreciation for their work. (laughs) 
They're going to be commissioned at the beginning of the second service so everyone can celebrate them, and then they're taken off before, uh, before the end of that service, which means you have the wonderful privilege of actually seeking out one of them this morning after the end of the service and asking them about, uh, about going and the trip itself and your appreciation for their work. Let's send them out now. Okay, go ahead, guys. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> I, I, we did a blessing just with like an additional prayer. So let's pray for you. Let's watch. Uh, God, please watch over uh, these um, um, these students and uh, and disciples and uh, members of our community. Uh, keep them in your your safety and uh, and your care and uh, and fill them up for uh, for all the work that you you have made them a part of. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right, you can go out. Okay, are stand. you doing the benediction? No, okay. Will you stand with me as you're comfortably able? Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you God's peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll join together in our closing hymn now.
go in peace, serve the Lord.